Welcome to the Queer Conversation podcast brought to you by Lotto Media, a show where we discuss all things queer. I am your host, Silke Bader, a publisher and producer in the LGBTQI space in Australia for the past 30 years. Sylvia Kinder was born in 1948. She is a teacher, union activist, radical lesbian feminist since the 70s and is now mostly active as an organizer in the older lesbian movement. She is a significant participant in the Adelaide Women's Liberation Movement and the Sydney Women's Liberation Movement. Sylvia has also been instrumental in questioning sexist teaching practices within schools, helping to reduce gender discrimination and thriving towards equal opportunities for girls. Today she is still involved in the lesbian community and is an outdoor enthusiast who enjoys bushwalking, cycling and kayaking. movement was only just sort of beginning in the state they wrote a lot of articles and those articles were event uh, they had they called them notes from the first year that was 68 notes from the second year that was 69 notes from the third year and they put them in a book sisterhood is powerful and the book has every single political idea about the women's liberation movement including radical lesbianism from the very beginning there was this book of everything uh, had all the arguments about everything you can think of that we discuss today really the connection between the heterosexual and lesbian community was really powerful because all of it was women's rights we were not divided straight feminists and the lesbian feminists were like they just did everything together we were full of energy and we didn't have any fear about getting the sack I think we cared more about our politics than we did about what might happen as a result of them. I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was working at the Women's Studies Resource Centre, we only had one and a half salaries. So myself and the other woman, we worked full time, but the one who was on the full salary shared some of her money with the other woman to make us both have three quarters of a salary. There was something significant that was happening in Australia. Number one was International Women's Day 1975. So that was like a big publicity thing. So that was one thing that pushed us forward, I think, as a movement, because we were very involved in, in all the things that happened. And United Nations made a big song and dance about women's issues internationally. When the United Nations pa passes resolutions, they have to sign to say they agree. All right, well, there were lots of resolutions passed at these events in 75 and 80 about women's issues and lesbian rights, being involved with the non-government women's groups when they were preparing their submissions to get lesbian issues in there. We were trying to get into the system to, to change things. We were trying to be international as well. And um, so that leads us into, in a way, how we were in the 90s. We saw ourselves as having to do more than just working on our own personal stuff and we had to do something for women as a whole. But of course, also the gay movement as well, we supported that because of the terrible oppression that was happening. But I think what really changed things really in, uh, towards the 80s was the AIDS crisis. It had a big effect on, on, on the gay and lesbian movement. Um, I mean, it was a terrible tragedy. It took a lot of energy and emotion. But when the AIDS crisis started, the connection there, people knew who their friends were. People started to see that um, there, there were straight people who supported them. There's, there's a movement there of people who support. So there was parents and there was uh, supporters and friends and people started to change um, they saw that there was a, uh, I suppose, a connection between all the different groups. I do see a f bit of a change in some of the younger women. I think some of them are suddenly feeling a bit of a backlash. You know, there's a bit of a conservative push around the world. And so I think it'll radicalise the younger people. Um, they have to fight again, you know, fight again for some of the things. And I hope 
I mean, I don't know what's happening in Australia, but there were, certainly there was, let's face it, there was about 40% of people voted against gay marriage. Why? Why did they care? But they did. Gail Ewerson is now in her 70s, is a retired bookseller and an ongoing activist. Gail came out as a lesbian in the mid-70s after being married twice and getting arrested at the first Mardi Gras. She has worked in various women's services and co-owned the feminist bookshop in Lilyfield from 1984 to 2011 alongside her sisters. I grew up with a grandmother who was a suffragette who talked a lot about working to get the votes for women and around about 74, 75 I started attending International Women's Day marches and I remember one year Jermaine came out from England and led the march. I think it was 1975. It was starting to become a very exciting time. Women's refuges starting and women's health centres and a lot of stuff happened around 1974-75. I was really ready to be an activist and I just jumped into it head first. And we demonstrated and we did graffiti and we started newsletters and we started groups and supported each other and it was a fantastic time. We were out marching for something or other just about every weekend. We had a funny little thing called a telephone tree. If we wanted to uh, let women know that there was going to be a particular demonstration, I'd have a list of women that I would ring and somebody else would have a list of women that they would ring. And we'd, we'd, run, off, we'd run newsletters off with a, a sort of gestetna machine or something. I don't even remember what, exactly what it was, but it was primitive. So I was at the, um, I was at the march on the morning of the first Mardi Gras and in the evening I went to the Mardi Gras. The, we call it now the first Mardi Gras, but it was just a, a march with a, a truck and some music and we were hoping to have a little party in Hyde Park. And I was there and I was one of the 52 arrested. So that makes me a 78er. In 1974, actually, it was the uh, Leichhardt Women's Health Centre, the Rape Crisis Centre and the Feminist Bookshop. Uh, were all started in 74. Uh, my involvement in the feminist bookshop didn't start until 1982. The two women who had started the feminist bookshop, June and Julia, they were passionate feminists. After I came out, very, very quickly, one of my new friends took me to the feminist bookshop and, oh, I loved it, absolutely loved it. I would go there at least several times a week and soak up the atmosphere. Around about the 1980s, I started to get the impression from Julia that she was getting a bit tired and she wanted to get out of it. And I thought, oh my God, it would be such a disaster if this little, this little treasure disappeared. How can I support her? I didn't really know what to do about it, but I was definitely concerned that we might lose it. I had a very loved auntie who died and left me and my sisters a small house in Adelaide. My sisters by this time had also both become feminists and don't ask me how or why this happened, but they were both lesbians as well. So they used to go to the feminist bookshop also and loved it. After Auntie Joni died and left us this house, I had the idea and I said to my sisters, how would you like to put the money that Auntie Joni has left us into going into a business together, how about we buy the feminist bookshop? Didn't take very long to decide. They were really keen. And so we asked Julia you know, how this could be arranged and if she was interested, she was overjoyed. And uh, the money we had covered what we needed to buy the business, which we did. When we took it over, we moved it and then we set about making it an activist centre. And and as such, it became well-known throughout Australia. When we first took over the bookshop, the lesbian section would have been about like that, a dozen books. Very, very quickly, the lesbian section in the bookshop became as big as any, as any other section. And then publishers like Nyad Press and um, 
oh, there was a lot. There was a lot of publishers who were then publishing lesbian books, but Naiad Press was the major one, and they started putting out um, lesbian fiction. And two of the leading writers in that Naiad Press stable were Claire McNabb, an Australian writer, and Catherine Forrest. So there was pressure from the lesbian publishers on, for example, Claire and Catherine, churn them out, you know, churn them out. And so they were churning out these books and lesbians were lapping them up. Lesbians were loving them. Lesbians wanting books to reflect their lives. It peaked as an enormous industry. We had lesbians all over Australia ordering books from our newsletter. By that time, the feminist bookshop did become um, an important pl space for women, but more especially for lesbians, because lesbians needed a safe space and they needed to have somewhere that they could come where they felt accepted and appreciated and loved and cared about. Um, as soon as Lottle became available, we were the major place where, where lesbians would pick up their Lottle and... And so lesbians would come there if they wanted to know what was going on. People would advertise if they wanted a flatmate or if they had a house with a room in it. We even had a folder that was um, wanting, to, you know, lesbians wanting to meet other lesbians. Put mothers and fathers coming to the shop with their 15-year-old daughters just coming out as a lesbian, looking for something to read to help the parents. We'd have women of 65 just outing themselves as lesbians, coming for, to us for support. Where can I go? How can I meet people? We were sort of an informal counselling service. We fairly soon came to the attention of a gang of local boys. They threw eggs and stuff at our windows. <coughs> they shouted abuse as they walked past. It got so bad that um, one year a group of feminists... Um, got together a vigilante band and did a roster and stood guard outside <laughs> to um, scare them away every time they came. They sort of, I don't know how they did it. We were uh, working inside trying to get on with our work and these gorgeous women were outside just watching and, and laying in wait for these boys and eventually they got sick of badgering us the Feminist Bookshop and Lottle and various other things were really needed at the time to dispense information. The Feminist Bookshop was very much a centre of community. Lottle, in its way, was a centre of community. We were fighting for change. We were fighting to, for space. We were fighting to create community. And in a way, the success of feminism and the success of that fight really meant the end of the institutions that were doing the fighting, i.e. the Feminist Bookshop, Lottle. On many levels, we've been successful and change has happened and, and a lot of that change is, is permanent. You know, we've, we've really succeeded in changing society. Elizabeth Ashburn was born in 1939. She is an artist, activist and academic. As an artist, writer and academic, she has been involved in the education of artists since 1964 as Emirates Professor at the University of New South Wales and a conjoint professor at the University of Newcastle. She was awarded an Order of Australia Award for services to the Education Fine Art, Contemporary Australian Art and to the community. I have been involved in the gay and lesbian community in all sorts of ways. My thesis for my doctorate was about queer studies in the university. The book that I wrote was about showcasing the work of lesbians in Australia. It was called Lesbian Art. I had the subtitle, An Encounter with Power. I pulled together a survey of what lesbians were doing and they were all sorts of lesbians. And there, there were even 
all sorts of things that came up in in having it published. Um, for example, uh, because of the explicit nature of some of the imagery, it could only be published in one place. And I think it was I think it was in China that it was published. And the publisher came to me and said, "Look, we have difficulties with these images." And I said, "You don't put them in; we don't publish." And um, the book was um, the book was reviewed by the Sydney Morning Herald, and it was it had, that review has been included in a book called The Worst Art Reviews, right? It was so awful because it was nothing about the book. Indeed, it was like the person who reviewed it hadn't even bothered opening it. It was all about lesbians and, you know, how stupid it all was and pathetic and how awful the art was. Indeed, I was at a party and the editor came to me and said, oh, I'd like you to meet the publisher. And she went away and she came back and she said, look, I'm terribly sorry. I said, would you like to meet one of your authors? And he said, yes. What's the book? And she said, lesbian art. He said, I don't want to meet them. That, that was what it was like. So there were good things about being around then. And there were bad things about it. Bad things about being beaten up. Good things about the excitement and camaraderie that was there. You've got the Order of Australia. What did you get that for? I got it for a range of things. When you get it, you go to Government House and this gentleman with a very English voice reads what it's for. And I was so pleased because it was for my contribution to a whole range of things. But one of them was my contribution to the gay and lesbian community. And he used the words in Government House. Would there be anything that you often think is important for the young generation to take on? I, I think it is very difficult for young people to be able to deal with the the things that matter and that have meaning to them, it's very difficult for them to even sort out what they want to do, let alone have insight in what they want to be. Uh, I'm not sure that it's going to be easier for young people to find who and what they are particularly if their sexuality is not mainstream. And that, that bothers me. I became a lesbian in my 40s, but it took me to be 40 to finally feel, yes, this is where I want to be sexually. So it, it's, 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 a, it's a task for everyone to have, and it's not easy. I, it's like a costume. I, I put it on. I try it, I see if it's me, and if it fits and it feels good, well, then that might be what I am. And, and perhaps that's the benefit of today because there are so many costumes. There are so many ways you can think about yourself uh, to, to, to try, but, but how disastrous would it be if you tried all of them on and none of them fitted? <laughs> if you were so unique, what would you do? You'd have to start a new group of yourself. Robin Bleister was born in 1948. She is a lesbian activist. She risked her job teaching at an Anglican girls' school when a photo of her on the ground in front of a paddy wagon at the first Sydney Mardi Gras in 1978 appeared in the paper the following day. Today, her activism continues. My involvement with the LGBTQ plus community started in 1972. During the 1978 
a gay solidarity march, which was um, in the evening, so it was a festival. Um, it's now known as the first Mardi Gras. We unfortunately um, got stopped partway down the march. We were going to stop at a Hyde Park. A few of us decided because we were then geared up um, that w we would go up William Street and we reached the top of the cross, ended up at El Al Alamein Fountain. Well, we amalgamated around the fountain and the police had noted all of this and they had called in every paddy wagon that was around and they were ready for us. They told us it was an illegal march and to disperse. We started to disperse, but because there were so many of us, walking back up Darlinghurst Road was the only way of getting out of there because all the footpaths were absolutely full of all the King's Cross people, as well as some of the people that had been um, at the Mardi Gras. Unfortunately, I must have been terribly visible because I had a jacket on which had um, sort of wool around the edges and the police grabbed me first and they were pulling me, but at the same time, there was three women on one arm and the police on the other arm, they were pulling in opposite directions and I had another woman who grabbed me around the waist trying to get me away. Went back onto the footpath, but what I saw then was the police who had taken their badges off so they couldn't be identified were really laying into the women first. Suddenly they were confronted by this absolute uh, hate, I guess, and, uh, you know, I saw women with their hair being pulled, shoved into paddy wagons, etc. And then they started on the men as well. So we had 53 uh, that were arrested that night. Luckily, I wasn't arrested. However, the, the I think it was the Telegraph had taken a picture of me, which was in the Telegraph the next day. Of course, it was me spread eagled between police on one side and women holding me on the other. Well, I was working in a religious school in the eastern suburbs and I went to school and at the end of the day, the principal called me in before I left and hauled me over the coals and said, you know, were you you know, involved in this? And I said, yes, I was. Um, and then she wanted to know if I was homosexual and, you know, the way she said it, you know, she kept on saying, and homosexuality is sick, etc. Um, I, I sidestepped most of the questions because I knew I'd be fired. Um, although I also knew that my friends at camp would be up there chained to the front post the next day. Um, but, you know, these thoughts go through your head. Oh, you know, I'll be out of a job. I still owe it money on the house, the car, <laughs> whatever else. Um, and so by saying that I wasn't arrested, she didn't have much to go on. In 1976, I formed the Lesbian Mothers Group. And what we tried to do in that was fight for equal rights for lesbian mothers along with heterosexual women in terms of getting custody of their children. I was also working on the lesbian teachers group because as a, as a teacher, I felt there was a lot of discrimination, not only for um, lesbian teachers, but also for children in schools. What's on for me in the next few 
years as far as the um, lesbian community is concerned is that I'll continue being involved in 1040 Matrix, which deals with um, older lesbians, over 40, but it brings together like-minded people who can then work together on any issues that come up. We, we also have olderdykes.org, um, which provides information because there's many older lesbians who may be isolated in the home through disability um, or also living in rural or regional areas that need information and lesbian-specific information. So those are the sorts of things that we are involved in. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you would like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest from us, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok or Facebook using the tag at Lottle Media or head over to our website lotl.com. Thanks again. And I'll see you next time.